not a cross stitch? <laughs> All right, so here's how today's going to work. Um, Nicole and I are going, mostly Nicole, but me as well. Um, we're going to be talking about cross stitch. Um, we've both been cross stitching for a very, very long time. And it's, in fact, how we met is on a video game cross stitch website. Um, did you know that, Jordan? I think so. Yeah, so um, so because of Cross Stitch, Nicole and I are business partners, and we travel, and we do all sorts of things. So we're going to go through all of the basics of Cross Stitch. We're going to Cross Stitch. Um, uh, all right, so first off, Jordan and I have to pick what we're going to do. So these are the kits that we bought from from Nicole. Uh, so we've got the Slimers that glow in the dark. Nicole told me that this is the hardest of these. Um, yes. we, we also have these minis, which are on plastic canvas. So you yeah. don't have to prep them. Um, and we have the wash your hands. So, George, what do you want to make? I don't know. <laughs> I think as much as I want to do that, I want to show prep and other things for basic cross-stitch. So I'm going to do the wash your hands. Do you want to do that one with me or do you want to do something else? Um, I'll just pick this one. You want, you want the slime? Of course you want the slime. <laughs> okay. All right. So first thing, whenever you are cross-stitching... Um, I like to prep my surface, so I will prep mine, um, and then, Nicole, you can talk about how you prep yours, um, and then, of course, if anyone else has any other ways that they prep their Ada, uh, please feel free to tell us in chat. Um, so, what I always do with, with prepping my Ada, oh, Nicole, I didn't know you included a card with holes punched in there for your threads. Yeah, a little, little thread sorter. It's Aww. funny, I actually had someone message me on Etsy being like, hey, we make thread sorter cards and we can totally do them for you and stuff. And I didn't respond because I was like, yes, I too can print on a piece of paper and punch some holes in it. Thank you, friend. Right? Um, it's like, well, I think they meant like they could like have it special, but you can print onto this too and be like, put this in there and there and there. No, it, it wasn't. I'll show you the pictures off stream. Okay, it's basically this. It's basically that, but the holes were square, oh, and the okay. text was plain and tiny. Oh, okay. All right, so what I do... So now, you notice with Ada, um, it's fraying a little bit on the edges. Um, if you don't do anything to that, uh, it's going to continue to fray as you're working. I like to use tape, because I'm going to wash it afterwards anyways. So I like to actually use uh, masking tape on mine to cover the edges. If you are doing a plastic canvas like Jord, there's no fraying, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, so I'm just going to go across right there and tear it. And this is literally all you do to prep your surface. And now there's a couple other things you can do. I know there's fray check that you can add to it. Nicole, how do you prep Ada? Um, I, if I'm being honest, I don't use uh, Ada too much anymore. Uh, mostly when I use it, I'm making cards and I'm just working in hand. So yeah, I'll either just use some tape, um, but Sapphire brings a good point. If I'm working on a big project, be it on uh, Ada or not, because the fabric I work on is called Even Weave. Uh, I actually have some next to me because I've also been using this for cards. So mm -hmm. this is Even Weave. And uh, the reason I like it is because unlike working with Ada, which I've got a sample here too. Uh, oh God, I don't know if this will be in focus enough because they're both white on yes. white. I did not think about that. No, no, that's fine. They're in focus. Well, but you can't really see the difference in the holes because it's white oh, on white. Oh yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and I don't have any dark colors right, right next to me. They're further away. But anyway, um, it's using even weaves of thread um in order to make a more uniform fabric look oh. rather than mostly with ida and tony could get a good probably better picture than i with the fabric she has there's very visible holes for where you're going to go up and go down uh not unlike here we go here's some white plastic canvas kind of you kind of see yeah see here's the difference between the plastic canvas yeah yeah tony's got a better ada. camera than i but see how you see those holes on even weave, they're much, much, much smaller. So it really is for experienced workers um, because you really got to be able to pay attention to uh, what's called either going over one or over two. Uh, we won't really get into that because it's a beginner stream, but that's mm -hmm. generally what I use. But even this, as you can see, it does get some fray on the edge. So if I don't use tape, I'll do what Sapphire mentioned and do surging. 
Yes. And that basically is you go down to your sewing machine and you run like a, a zigzag type stitch mm -hmm. around the edge. Or a And that'll help lock those in place so yep. they're not going to go anywhere. Honestly, I recommend doing that when you're working on big pieces, mm -hmm. uh, especially or really anything you're going to frame because yes. it's going to not only weather the storm of your multiple handling and moving the fabric around, it's also going to help when it comes to actually framing mm -hmm. your piece and having to like tighten it up and get everything set and done, be it by yourself or at the framer. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It is, um, uh, if you can surge it, if you have a sewing machine, surge it. If not, you've got the, you can use tape, um, you can use thread check. I'm looking to see yep. what everyone else says in chat for their options. Um... Or alternatively, if your piece is small and you're doing like I've been doing, um, where you're working on cards, like. Here's a piece of Ida, and you can kind of see the effect in the sunlight a little bit here I have coming through, uh, but this is an opalescent fabric, so yes. it actually has a little glimmer and shimmer to it, um, but a lot of commercial stuff that you get is very stiff. It's been overly mm -hmm. starched in order to accommodate people that like to work in hand, and that'll basically go away once you wash it, Yes. Uh, but this one with the shimmer um, filament in it um, is extra stiff because that filament is a type of plastic to get the shimmer effect. So um, I don't even put anything on these when I'm working on this size where it's just a little like five by five piece mm -hmm. that I'm going to cut out and put on a card. Um, so yeah, uh, depending yep. on what you're doing, you should decide what's going to be best for your project and what's the best way to prep it and get it ready mm -hmm. for stuff. And that's the thing, the, the more cross stitch you do, the more you're going to understand all these little nuances, um, the more you understand what you prefer. And there's so many yes. other ways. So look, as we were talking about how to cross stitch, there's actually two different ways to cross stitch. And I never knew that until I was 28. I have been cross stitching since I was six years old. I only ever thought there was the stab and pull method. I didn't know there oh, was a sewing method. method. Yes. And mm -hmm. it was it was either Firehawk or Black Mage Heart that introduced me to the sewing method, and it changed my life. Um, I could see it being Black Mage Heart because they just whip out stuff like crazy, and they yeah. talk so, about a lot on the forums. How so does Firehawk. So does Firehawk. It's ridiculous. Now I'm not going to use my holes for right now. You notice how I'm organizing my thread. That's the thing you should always do first is get all of your thread organized so you can easily get it. You can easily go to it, whether you use your card or laying it down or whatever. See, Sharon does the sewing method. Yeah, especially if um, you should really put your um, organize your thread, be it in some sort of sorter. I include them in my kits, but yep. um, some of the ones like Dimensions, they now have them. I'm of two minds about what they do. Mm -hmm. I don't think Tony's bought one of their kits in a while, so she might not know. They basically have a cardboard and a piece of foam on the back, and they glue the end of the thread between the two. Oh. And pre-sort it. So I don't like that it leaves that glue residue on yeah, the end. Yeah, you have to trim that off, but yeah. Um, but uh, it, it, it does come all pre-sorted now, which is nice okay. for those really advanced kits. Um yeah, but, as yeah, we'll show it to you. We'll show you the different methods. Um, and Safari uses a paper plate that she hole punches. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, anything will work. You yeah. just want to sort it. I'd say the only time that you don't have to sort it is when you're doing something like me. Like, I'm working on some more of these demos for my mini kits today. I was um, that mini designs. And I have all of my floss mm -hmm. just wound on bobbins. I actually That's what I was going to grab, yeah regular dmc line and i'm slowly collecting all the specialty ones now too um but it's already technically sorted because it's on these bobbins and i've got the numbers in the uh upper corner upper right corner is where i like to put them on mm -hmm. here so as long as i'm only working on one color at a time it's really easy for me to just pull what i need and cut it off um but if you're just starting out i always recommend starting with a kit and if it doesn't come with a thread sorter, just real quick, take a hole punch, make yourself one on a paper plate or any other sturdy sort of paper you have at the house. Yep. And that's exactly what I do. And and Sharon, what you said with the big plastic organizers and you bobinate them. Yeah, I do the same thing. I have four or five plastic organizers of floss. So I have a ton. I have a ton of them. Yeah, you can also use a note card. That's a, yep. a really good idea, Sapphire. You just don't want to use regular printer paper because yes. it's so flimsy 
that it's just card stock rip when you try and like yep. do a little loop knot through to secure um your your thread in there yep yeah so at least a card stock thickness for, uh, to yes. use um mm -hmm. all right so getting started first thing is you have to decide how many strands you want to use of your thread um, there are you, so every single DMC floss, when you get your, your strand of thread, you'll, if you actually go through and you count all of these individual little threads, whenever the camera actually focuses, it helps focus. if you spread it out a little bit, Tony, there we go. It's focusing now. So you see all those little threads there. You can kind of see them right there. There are actually six, six threads per DMC. So what you need to do is separate them and pull them out. Don't use all six unless you have a really, really, really big holes in your ADA or in your floss. Um, yeah. Or if you're working on a plastic canvas, like in my keychain one uh, here, I've got one right mm -hmm. here. Um, you can see, like, look how big these holes are. Yes. Yeah, like, that, that's you what you need the whole thing. See them. Yeah. This is, I believe, 10 count plastic canvas. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one I recommend using six strands on. Actually, this is from my classes over the summer. So you can see how that filled in the stitches there. Yeah. And it's, um, so whenever people talk about strand, three strand, two strand, six strand, that's what they mean. How many individual little pieces of this of this thread are you going to be including in your project okay um a lot of the beginner kits like nicole's if you look at nicole's pattern she actually says in this case use two and she also says the floss number so this is the dmc floss number correct yes so if you decide that you know what i don't want two i want three you can just go out and buy some more and that'd be fine um then there is a little bit extra in here but they may not be extra for three um yeah, I don't think there's enough for a coverage of three because right. you can get, so I use 20 inch pieces um, in my beginner level kits and it's, you get about 150 stitches out of every six strand cut mm -hmm. of uh, color for that's 20 inches long. So basically about 25 stitches for every one strand that you double over to use as two. Um, but uh, if you do three strands, that 20 inch piece now only gets you 100 stitches. So it, it drops pretty quickly. So yeah, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to use three for coverage. Like right. coverage is really people's personal preference. Yep. Two is the default for 14 count, which is what Tony's working on. Mm -hmm. And 14 count means there's 14 stitches per inch. Um, that's always how the counts are measured, by the way. Whatever yes. it says 14, 10, 7, 28, that's how many stitches you can get per inch. Yep. So um, you take I get, you take your um, your measuring ruler, and you can actually put an inch down, and you can count that's how many blocks are in there. Yes. Um, so, yeah, some people like the look of three strands at a time. Um, they feel like it gives a more full coverage. And I would agree for maybe some colors, like... If you're doing white on black or black on white, mm -hmm. um, especially because the darker DMC colors almost seem to be a little bit thinner because of the dye process they go through. It's been theorized. I don't know enough about it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, your kit's going to have in there what they recommend if it's your first time and you're working from a kit. Um, but even any pattern that you buy from Etsy, Heaven and Earth Designs, um, wherever that you're just buying a digital pattern from or even a physical pattern, they're going to have that color table on there. And it's going to be like, here's our recommended. Mm -hmm. But like, that's not a gospel. Um, right. If it's your first time doing it, I recommend using the recommended. Yes. But if you're an experienced stitcher, then you know you can adjust that and use however many strands you like. Yep, exactly. It's we, for your first couple get beginning kits. Everything's there for you. It's super easy. Whether you get it from Nicole or um, Dimensions or another maker, make sure it's beginner. And and once you get learn, once you get to understand what everything is, then make changes, do things that you want because you understand the reasons why. Uh, okay, so I grabbed the blue because I decided I'm just gonna do the your in my kit first. So there are two ways to get started on here for how you figure out where you're going to go on your actual cross stitch. Um, and there's two trains of thought. The first one 
is I'm going to start in the very center. Now, the nice thing with, with this is it was folded like this already. So I already know exactly where my center is right there. And all patterns, when you take a look at it, you see how there is a little arrow at the top on the, on the very top, and there's an arrow on the left. That's your center. So I can look down and I can look over and right here at the bottom of my O is the center of my pattern. So if you go center first, start there and that's where you get started. The other train of thought, which is actually what I do most of the time, I start in the upper left hand corner and I work my way down and this drives some people like Nicole crazy. So, okay, so now the reasoning behind doing both of those things. Yes. Some people just enjoy working from one side to a piece and moving to the other, um, much like how you're reading a book. Yes. However, the school of thought behind starting in the middle is to make sure you have enough material and you're starting on the right spot. Now, in Tony's piece there, the finished side is going to be five by seven. Easy size to put into a frame. Mm -hmm. However, if you're not counting the correct amount of space in from the top and from the side to get started if you're just like oh i'm just going to start in the upper left corner like you'll end up being way be way off. way off centered you won't have enough fabric to help you when you go to put it in a frame so that's yeah. why as a beginner it's really recommended you start in the center of your piece and then as you get some experience yeah start yes. however and wherever you want because you know how to count in and measure and mark yep. and do whatever for your start but if you're just starting please start from the center yeah. because they always include more than enough material for you to be able to put it on there. But if you start in a corner, I've seen it happen way too many times. People are like, Oh no, this will be plenty of space. And then they do their last few stitches and they're right up at the edge. And they're like, yeah. is there anything I can do to fix this? Can I add more fabric on? And the answer is yes, but you're not yeah, going to like it. No. To yeah. Start. Yeah. Normally, Whenever I start, I like to start in the upper left hand corner, but I always buy like yards and yards and yards of Ada. And so like I'll grab an Ada and then I'll start it and then I'll work from top to bottom. And I know that's my area. Like I'll do it almost like an outline and then I'll then cut my area from that. And I have my outline that I can then work through and within. I'm weird. I'm very weird with how I do it, but that's just the way that I like to do it. Right. Okay. Okay. The, uh, the next thing is thread conditioner. This is actually something that um, Nicole makes and sells as well. Um, there's a couple of manufacturers of thread conditioner, um, but it is awesome. Like, I don't know why I never, ever, ever use thread conditioner until Nicole and I discovered it right about the same time. So Nicole, I think it's because they don't really carry it in the store. Yeah, um, that's true. They don't carry it at Michael's or, or no Joann's. Joann's or yeah, that's true. It's more of a, um, a custom kind of specialty thing. So Nicole, why do people want to use thread conditioner? So the thing that's going to help you with thread conditioner is that uh, basically what thread conditioner is doing when you use it is it's going to help tame those stray fibers. Mm -hmm. Cause, and I'm sure Tony has maybe noticed this as she's working on her stuff, but um, here you can kind of see it on mine here. Uh, if I can catch the light, right? Maybe. Uh, but you'll see that there's the little stray fibers that get pulled off there. And uh, what this does is it helps not only pull those down, um, and then you're applying this like waxy coating to go over and it's a light waxy coating. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to look overly coated. Do it one time. Wax, don't don't sit yes. and do it a bunch of times. Just do it one time. One time. Yep. Uh, oh, yay. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. It's, I like that scent. It's just very outdoorsy when we can't go outdoors right now. Mine's or, bookworm. Well, not really anyway. Uh, but anyway, um, so you put it on there. The and not only does it tame it on that, but then as you're going through your fabric, be it, you know, uh, linen, even weave, Ida, um, those fibers are now not going to catch on that fabric anymore either. Right. So you're going to have a much smoother experience going through and you're going to be less likely that it's going to get twisted up and get caught itself into knots. Yeah. Now, it'll still get twisted just from you turning the needle adjust uh, minorly in your hand. So still let it drop and untangle. But... I personally have noticed, and I've been stitching for almost three decades now, that um, it easily cut my number of knots 50 or 70% down mm -hmm. just by using this and dropping the needle as much as I normally ever did. So, yeah, uh, yeah really 
even if you don't get mine, I really recommend giving this stuff a try. Yep. I do personally make now sample sizes. So if you just want to have a little bit and feel like you're not wasting something, uh, the smallest pack I offer is just, yep, that's right, them right there. They're a little brick. Um, they're a dollar each, and then I discount them by volume. Um, and so the smallest one you can get, three for $3, and you can pick three cents, call it a day. Um, I know shipping takes a long time right now because it's the holidays and everything, yep. but uh, yeah, uh, there's other brands. There's other people that make it besides me. Mine's all natural. I use all organic beeswax. Um, I use a little bit of uh, almond oil, which helps nourishes the thread as well and condition it. <laughs> and then I have some um, high grade triple filter fragrance oils that I use. Um, I'm laughing at Sapphire's joke. I couldn't believe how nice it was to use a conditioner. Like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly how yeah. I felt because yeah, I started first using time? it before yeah. Tony did yeah. um, sometime mid-summer last year. Yeah, it was, and it, yeah, I it was, was like, oh my God, Tony, this stuff is so nice. You have to try it. And she was like, eh, when I get the time. And then I gave her some of my first yeah. few tins which hers look like mine because this stuff will last you a long time. Like yeah. these are some of my original tins. She gave tins. this to me almost a year ago and I'm still, you see how much, how yeah. little I've used it. And you can tell cause I just have nothing on here. The ones that I have now, the commercial ones, uh, actually I just made some more coconut and lime today. Um, I've got a really nice little like label and a picture and everything on there. Um, Whereas Tony and I have this jank stuff right here yeah. that's just super <laughs> minimal. Uh, but this will last you like it, a, a while. Super yeah. long time. Um, and, and I am planning on doing a, a video tutorial, either myself or Nicole. We've been talking about it for a few months of what do you do when the wax kind of gets down low and it's only you know, the very edges of it? How do you, you know, melt it and, and bring it together and continue to reuse it kind of thing? Well, yeah, not only that, but you might just find because uh, wintertime can dry out just about anything. Yeah. You know, your hands are a good example of that. Um, I'm actually looking, I haven't told Tony yet, uh, I'm going to be experimenting this winter because people have enjoyed these scents so much of making a, um, a shea butter nourishing hand cream mm. that you can keep like with your sewing supplies. Um, but anyway, uh, what you, while these screw in and they certainly help keep them from drying out, mm -hmm nothing's foolproof no. um so this can also be one of the things if you just feel like the bed has gotten like kind of dry or you've just run so many fibers in there that they just get all caught up and you just want to get rid of them and it's just a way to refresh the tin and get it all nice and clean and yep. smooth and stuff yep so yes, it's great for english paper piecing and really any hand sewing yes so you know I... you can use this stuff on sewing thread too and it does the exact same mm -hmm. thing any hand sewing I do, whether it's cross stitch, EPP, regular hand sewing, we always use these. And in fact, the next time Gen, Gen Con rolls around, the Nicole and I are going to be teaching classes. Any hand sewing classes that I use, um, I, we're going to be using these tins. We're going to actually be practice. So if you take classes from either Nicole or I, you'll be able to um, play with these uh, firsthand. So um, the thing about allergies is certainly oh. a concern. Uh, I can only tell you what I put in my own. Um, I would never dare to call it hypoallergenic, um, mostly because I know people can have all sorts of allergies about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say I get the best materials that I can. Uh, these are just aluminum tins. I don't think many people have aluminum allergies, but I make sure I clean them before I use them. Um, and then I have a clean work surface that I work in. So it really is just the straight up um, beeswax that I'm melting and putting in here and then adding in the two oils and then letting it sit to cool mm -hmm. and like sealing it up. Yeah. So I do my best myself to contamination. And I know that some people, even with that, can have issues with um, fragrance oils, like either something that goes into making the oils um, or just something about the scent themselves bothers people. So I also make this without the fragrances too. So if you just want an unscented, uh, I put in a little bit extra of the almond oil to make yes. up the difference. So that way it still has the same quality um, and you can still use yep. some and enjoy it and know that there's only two ingredients going in there, pure almond mm -hmm. oil, 
um, triple filtered organic beeswax, and that's it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The unscented is maybe the way you want to go, bookworm, if you want to try them out. Oh. We've covered all of the basics. So this is all the prep that you do before you do your actual stitch. Uh, I'm going to start mine in the middle. And as Nicole was explaining this, I realized that actually it's the U right here, this area right there, that is the center. So I'm actually going to start my U area here and, and to figure that out. All right, so, all right, no, no questions. All right, fantastic. So what I'm gonna be doing is showing you how to get started. Now, whenever you're doing cross stitch, it's an X. It's a, that's why it's called cross stitch. Um, it's, so you wanna go from, um, so you wanna make an X. So, oh, hoop or no hoop? That's a great question, Rosalind. Hoop or no hoop? So basically as you, I would not invest in a hoop immediately because you may not know if you want to continue with cross stitch. If you decide that, yes, no, you do want to use a hoop on it. Um, the hoop actually helps stretch your Ada and make it more taut. So it's easier to actually sew. I know Nicole for all of her beginner kits, her beginner patterns, she has a hoop that actually comes with it. Um, well, there's the option to add a hoop. Oh, yeah. I let you add a hoop basically at cost because right. if you want to get a wooden hoop at a big chain store, it's going to cost you at minimum $2 right. for like a tiny little three inch hoop and then go up very, very quickly from there for these just little wooden things. So I just offer them flat across the board, buck 50, right. add it to your kit, no problem. Right, exactly. So if you decide to get a basic one that has a hoop, you can try to see, you know, how, you know, how does it feel to cross stitch within the hoop on or take the hoop off and do it without? I prefer no hoop unless I'm doing a gigantic project. In that case, I have a large hoop that I then move around the project for what I'm working on. So I know the area that I am working on. Um, so yeah, so hoops are another thing too. That actually was a, a great question. Thank you. Um, so now besides hoops, there's two other methods that you can use if you want to have tight fabric to work mm -hmm. on. I just grabbed my preferred method. I enjoy working on scroll frames. Now, I personally don't have something on a scroll frame right now, so I can't show you except the Breath of the Wild Tapestry, which is huge, and then the other room. So <laughs> uh, I'm not going to bring that in. But this is what's called a split rod scroll frame. As you can see, it's got that seam running down the middle of mm -hmm. it. And then it doesn't go all the way through, just most of the way. This is one of my smaller ones. So what you will do after you secure your edges, like Tony's done with some tape, or you serger them, is you would then take the fabric, put it through the split in the rod, go ahead and tape it down on there to the rod. You don't have to, I personally do just for extra security sake. And then once you have them in there, you put them in the end points. And you can see it's a really snug fit. And then you would have it on both ends. You would scroll it to start getting it tight, screw down the little corner parts um, in order to get it to the exact mm -hmm. uh, level of tightness that you want. Now, besides these, um, the other thing that's very popular is using what's called a uh, tension snap or the brand is Q-snap, which is most, most people call it. That's basically a hoop frame, but square. Right. Um, that uses PVC piping to uh, make a square shape and then it has these little things that click mm -hmm. on the left right top and bottom does the same thing as a hoop frame it's just square yeah. some people like that more than hoops something that's what i use debate. my big you, projects yeah there's all all three are good options and you just have to experiment to find what you like if you decide to keep cross stitching yeah exactly and it's um and sharon brought up a great point um, the making the super taut and making it super tight with either frames or hoops makes it easier for the stab and pull method, which is what I'm going to show you first, but it makes it harder for the sew method, which is what I'll show you second. Um, so it, so keep that in mind as we're showing you these things about if you want to try to do a hoop or not. Fantastic. Great questions. Okay. So I'm starting on my O. So I'm going to have these three things. Now, whenever we're going to do the stab and pull method first, sorry, I keep moving my things. Uh, so what you want to do first is to capture the end of your fabric in here. So the way that I do it and the way that's probably the easiest 
is first decide which way you're going to go for your X's. For me, I like to go to the bottom left to the top right and then bottom right to the top left. Wherever you decide, do the same exact thing for your entire project because it's going to keep your consistency together and it's going to make it look nice. So there's my bottom left. So all I'm doing is I'm going to go to the top right, right there. So you see how I went from my bottom left and I went across that X to my top right. Exactly. Being consistent and doing the tension. And then what you want to do is you want to pull this until you probably have about that much thread left. Let me show you close up on that camera. And then make sure you trap that thread in your turnover. So does everyone see how I did that? So you just trap that and then pull. And then now, no matter how hard I pull, you see how that thread's not coming out and you can see in my big camera, I'm pulling that thread. That baby's not coming out. You've just trapped your thread. So now in this case for my U, I need to go three X's across. So I'm not going to solve this X right away. What I want to do is keep on going. So I'm going to keep on going the top right and I'm going to pull this through. And this is why this is called the stab and pull. You stab this in and you can go back and forth like this to find your hole and then pull. Remember I said I want to go three across or you can use your fingers on the back side and figure out where it is and then poke it through just like that. So that's the stab and pull. All right. So here is I have my three. Whoops, whoops, whoops. There we go. I have my three little stitches. All right. So now real quick, because Tony and I, since we've been stitching for so long, um, that's skip the way stuff? we're used to doing it. And it's called starting with a tail. Yeah. However, there's instructions for this in my kit because they're so it's so much nicer for beginners. And this is called the loop start method. So instead of doing like how Tony just showed you where you're going to have that tail, you got to be careful about how far to pull it and you're going to stitch over it to secure your stitches. Mm -hmm. Instead, what you'll do is you'll take your piece of floss. I just have a red here because it's just going to show up nicer on the camera and you're going to fold it in half to get the equivalent of now two threads, mm -hmm. All right? And then you're going to go ahead and thread your needle. And she has the instructions for this right here yep. in her pattern down there. I got the there. instructions on the kit right yep. there. So now, as you can see, I've got, oop, if I don't drop it, I've got my finger looped around in this loop at the end. And I've also got it on my needle. So now what I can do is I can go up on the hole and I'm just using plastic canvas because it's what I have right here with me today. Much like Tony, I like going from lower left to upper right. Uh, so I'll go in that upper right hole and I'll turn it around now just so I can see better and show you guys. And I'm going to make sure that this needle comes through the loop. And then as it does, you can see loop grabs around the bottom. No muss, no fuss. It's attached there. It's not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about a tail. And uh, yeah, it's just one less thing to worry about now. This method only works for even numbers, so two, four, six strands, because you have to fold it in half to get a loop. Uh, oh. If you have a little more experience, you can experiment with odd numbers. It's not impossible. I've certainly done it before. But uh, yeah, in this case, using two strands, I recommend the loop method. It's very, very beginner friendly. And uh, honestly, I just like using it now that I have myself found out about it because it's so nice. <laughs> I've never nice heard of the loop life. method before. This is probably because I always use three strands in all my cross stitch. I've never yep. used two. Mm -hmm. That's that's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah. Are you doing three? Or are you doing three in yours? Okay, you can't do the loop method in yours then. I was looking she over cannot. yours. No, plastic yeah. canvas uh, three strands is generally recommended for coverage. If you do two strands, yeah, um, you're going to have a lot of it show through because unlike fabric, this is rigid. It's not going to bend. It's not right. going to break. Likewise, you don't need to use thread conditioner on this, really, because what's the fiber going to grab onto? The plastic? Well, it would not um, in itself. Yeah, you can do it on uh, your own, but yeah. um, you don't have to worry about it grabbing on the fabric. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah so uh, really cool. with three strands, it's not impossible, but 
we're kind of covering more beginner friendly stuff yes. so i won't i won't show yep. that today nope that's fine okay so i've got um so here's my back you see all my my lovely little things on the back so now with my instructions for my u this one i've got three that are over okay and then i want to go back three all right so at this point now i'm going to close my x's so i'm just going to make my x go in the upper left and you see all i'm doing is finishing those x's and going back the way that i came oops i got a little bit of nut right there let me oh look at that came right out because of the uh conditioner and there we are and there is my three little x's and that's it that's cross stitching that is absolutely it so now because this is the way that i started i have to have an x going the this way the diagonal going that way first whether i go from the right down to the bottom left or the bottom left to the top right it has to do that one first and then the other way second because if you take a look at these x's if i were to decide to switch it midstream you see how you can see that top thread that's why you want to be consistent throughout the entire way so you want to do the the so wherever however you start that's the way that you go got it kid jared's having too much fun uh, organizing all of her things no, yeah, she's got, I, she's got a lot I more colors than you. Um, I think there's like four shades of green and there's like three shades of red yeah. and then there's a glow in the, there's two different glow in the dark. Okay, sure, there. what you just did. Jordan's a genius. Okay, so on plastic canvas, plastic canvas is not Ada, so it's hard to fold it to find it without counting. The child just got a piece of paper, cut it the same way, same size as the plastic canvas, folded it, and then did this and then poked a hole in the center, which then bled through. That is her center of her no, plastic I, canvas. I put it underneath and then... Oh, you put it underneath it. and then stabbed it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she did a dot and then did this and then stabbed it. Yeah. And yeah. that, that's how she, she figured out her center to get started. The, the other way you can do it and what I usually recommend for people is, especially if it's not unclear, so like on this white one here, let me move that higher up so it can be seen, um, is you just take a straight edge. I'm just borrowing my little post-it note pad because it's what I have right here. And you just draw a line and draw a line from corner to corner. Yeah. And there you go. And there's your middle. There's your middle. Nice. Nice. All right. So next line, you guys ready to know the sewing method and then we'll answer questions and, and then get sewing for the day. All right, so my next line down has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that I have to do. So my next one down, now, oh, ways to hold your pattern. So you can have the pattern just like this. Um, one of my favorite ways to hold the pattern is using a board and magnet. There's actually metal boards that you can get where you put this on top of it, and then you have magnets that move down to actually tell you exactly what line that you're on. Um, it is a great way to stay organized. All right, so the next one down, I have, like I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the next one down is, and this is where I tend to hunt and peck to find it. There we go. So it is, it's going to be, let me do one to show you where I am. So here is the next one down. So you see how it's kind of one down and one over? And on the back, you can see how I kind of like jumped a little bit to get to that next one. Oh, you highlight your pattern? That's a good idea, Sapphira. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Jordan is highlighting hers too. Um, Yes, yes. No, the board with the, um, in fact, whenever I post this on YouTube, um, uh, this is a reminder to, to yourself, Tony, please put the link down below for the boards with the magnets. So if anyone's looking for those magnet boards for cross stitch, um, take a look at the YouTube video. I'll post it either this upcoming Monday or the Monday after, uh, and I will make sure that I have um, links to those so you can find them. So, all right. So sewing method, ready? Ready for me to blow your mind? Ready for this? All right, so 
sewing method. All you're doing is you are doing everything in one fell swoop. So instead of hunting and pecking, see there, let me see if I can get close to this. So you see there is my needle here. See, it's nice and loose for my next of where I'm going to go. I'm going to take this and I'm going to fold this over. And you cannot do this with a plastic canvas, unfortunately. This only works or for Ada. Or perforated paper. Yeah, or perforated paper. This only works for Ada. You fold it over and in one foul swoop, you do your, your sign. So you see how the needle is in there just like that. And, and then that way there's no hunting and pecking. You just do that and you pull it. This is what's called the sewing method. And if you're using Ada, it goes, and you, when you master this, you actually save half the time. And there, there's the next one. There's the back. So you can see it in there. Now it is going to take more time at first because you're just not, you're not used to it and you're going to have to take time doing it. All right. So that's three. Let's see how fast I can do the rest of this. And it does easier to do during the first one Four. this is how Sharon is able to pump out 50 million cross stitches for the uh, St. Jude fundraising that we do every year for that stuff. Um, yes, Sapphira, you can do that with print on fabric uh, as long as it is Ada and it's not plastic canvas and it's not perforated paper, that it is Ada that you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. One, two, Not three. just Ada, but really um, like even we even linen too, you just yes. have to be careful because there's not as many clear markers on those fabrics as there is on um, Ada where the grid is very visible yeah. um, to make sure you're going in the right hole. So again, it's going to take practice. Yeah, exactly. And there it is. So it's, I'm still trying to master the sew method. I am so used to the, to the stab and pull, stab and pull method, the where it's, I've got to train my brain again of, wait, no, I can do this thing. I can do this sewing thing. No, right. I'm going to be just a curmudgeon -y old lady now and just be like, I'm too set in my ways. Three decades of doing this method. and At the stab and pull? Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> I've, I've made peace with it. I'm good. Yes, exactly. So when right, you're so... first practicing, especially because that beginner kit you picked up, you know, especially like the Learner Craft series that's at a mm -hmm. lot of places like Michael's and Joanne's, we are just making like a smiley face and a poop emoji. If you have the top line of your stitch alternate where maybe you're going this direction and then the opposite diagonal, every other one, don't stress about it too much no. for your first little piece because you're learning and it's more important that you learn how to do the stitch and understand what's going into well, in it. Your beginning, yes. don't stress too much about having yes. all your cross stitches faced a certain way, having to start with the sewing method right off the bat. Yes. Like just start with understanding what you're doing and then once you have an understanding, experiment to see what you like best. Yes, exactly. And that's the thing. It's it don't don't worry about it, but be aware of the way that your oops, wrong way. Of the way that your crosses go. Be aware of it, but don't worry about it for your first few. Um and, and again, it's something that's happened. So all right, you guys ready for the next time saving cross stitch thing that I love? So you see how I've gone over here, I've gone seven stitches over. Um, at this point, I can choose to finish off those X's if I want to, or with the U, I have three stitches that I can do here. I'm actually gonna hunt and peck this one just to make sure that I have this right, because it's only three. And this is something that I like to do a lot whenever I'm cross stitching. So I was just looking over at the kid to see how she's doing. She's good. Jordan's like, I know how to do this, Tony. Come on, what are you doing? I yeah, have... she took my classes already. She did, yeah. she did. I have such clammy hands though, so like grabbing the needle from the back. Oh, is and because a... you're using plastic canvas, yeah. I've been struggling here. Yeah. So in this case, remember I'm making a <laughs> U. So you notice how whoops. In this case. There we go. You see how I just went up to the next level and I added my three. So this one is going to go back and forth and back and forth. 
So I'm actually going to continue now up my U and finish this all the way. And then I'll go back and close those X's. And that's how you cross stitch. That's it. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. Seriously. It's easy. Especially if you have like an easy beginner okay. kit. You guys um, ready to learn about, um, yeah, I know. Isn't the tension amazing? You ready to learn about outlining and things? Back stitching? Yes. Back stitching. That, that thing, that thing. <laughs> All right, so there's plenty of cross stitch patterns out there that don't bother with back stitching, and that's perfectly valid. You know, cross stitch is named for the type of embroidery stitch it is, which is a cross shaped stitch. Um, but one of the things that's a I believe it's came from embroidery and it's used in cross stitching is called a back stitch, and this is a stitch where it gets its name because you're working back well, forwards and then backwards along a line in order to give something a outline as Tony calls it, but it can also just be used to give definition to a piece, not necessarily just to outline part of it. So uh, I am using black for this part, as I'm sure everyone may have already guessed the theme for these minis that I'm working on. This one really gave it away. Um, but uh, I'm going to be uh, using some black on the gold here, and then I'll be using some white on the wings uh, over here. So, I can't show you my pattern because that's my whole point is I'm making tests of my demos, but uh, I'm coming up at one end of my line that's gonna go down here now. Um, all the back stitch lines for my minis, yep, Harry Potter. Um, and I've already got one of the ones finished right here that you can see in the corner, little Hogwarts Express there. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm starting here. I'm going to be going all around the ball here. Um, and I'm using a loop start because I uh, generally use two strands for back stitching on uh, these minis. It gives them a nice sort of like uh, almost cartoony outline to them um, that I like. And plus it makes it easier um, when you're working on this. So I've done the one stitch and now with back stitch, I will go forward ahead and then back down the line. So for my next one, which is right here, go forward and then back. So I'll try and get a little closer to the camera so you can kind of see, I'm trying to get the light right here, uh, the line that I'm working on here with the black. Um, now the other way that you can do um, your back stitching and this is a little bit more advanced technique, but uh, some people just like the way it looks. For me personally, I like the tension it gives. And this is going to be called, or it's called a double running stitch. So basically, instead of going forwards and back, you go forward along the line, but you skip every other one. And then you go backwards down the same line to fill in the space. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. You know, as she's working on that, it's interesting because the the charity ones that we do, there's no outlining or back stitching or anything, and that's the only reason because of that. Not because it's hard to do, because it's not. The only reason why we don't do that is because it will add an extra layer of definition to the actual stitching that not all of the pieces will have. So it's the um, cross stitch charity things that we do are all about uniformity. So that's why if you're like, hey, this is awesome. I want to do stuff for charity and I want to be part of this. There's no back stitching in that. But the back stitching is a really, really, really good point as Nicole is doing now is a really, really good thing to add um, that really makes your, your stitching stand out. Yeah, and I mean, it gives it a less pixely look. And I know one of the key things about um, doing the back stitching with or uh, doing the charity quilt stuff is that they look more pixely like the video games they're from yeah. whereas with this i now have a much more very 
rounded circle look to it rather than the very blocky shape that it was before. And then the other thing I'm going to do is add, like I said, it can be used for more than just outlines. It can also be used to give definition and detail. So that's what I'm going to do now and add some lines inside of the snitch here. And as you can see, I'm just going down the line and then I am going to go back along it. And I just like this method. I like the way that it pulls on the string and the tension that it gives in the end. So it's the one that I tend to use for stuff rather than doing the traditional backstitch method nowadays. And you don't have to start it on one end if you don't want to. I am being lazy and starting it right there for this one. Yeah, we can really see some of that definition popping out now. Before, it looked like a gold ball with some gray stuff at, you know, sticking out. But now you can actually start to see, have it take shape. Yup. That is the magic of backstitching. And it's all just made with a bunch of straight lines. Yeah. So and that's it. Fun. So, backstitching... This is what I call outlining. It's super, super easy to do, and it's easy to follow through and just finish that off. Now, you see how Nicole, we didn't talk about finishing them off. So I actually was going to show you this, but Nicole's got a nice close-up right now. Um, when you're finished with your thread, this is what you want to do. You want to take your thread and you want to slide it in. You can see my little hand over here on the right. Kind of slide it in um, and then pull it through and then trim it. And then you've basically what we what we call burying your thread. You've just buried your thread in there. So if you do any hand sewing, exactly what you do with hand sewing. And yep. then and all that's going to do is it's just going to secure your um, thread in place, so you don't have to worry so much the tension from the stitches you did before, which is why practicing your tension is such a big deal. Is going to be what holds that in place. Now that's not to say it's not impossible for it to come out, but if I rub my finger on here and just give it minor agitation, nothing's coming out because right. I've secured my threads. Yep, exactly. So it is um, definitely something to do as you're, you're securing your stuff. All right, let's go back to the, uh, the overall. So the whole, so I don't know if you could hear Jordan laughing at me while you were doing that. Um, I have a knot in my, uh, in my thing. I've somehow gotten a knot and it's driving me crazy. And that's why Jordan was laughing at me because I couldn't get the knot out. Oh, I see. She's laughing at your pain. See? See the knot? Yeah. So this is, if you get a knot, this is how you, you take care of it. You just kind of take the thread and you just kind of like, whoop! It's secured mm. in there. It's secured in there. It's magically gone. It's magic! It's gone! Ha ha! Not really. But I'll pretend it's gone. But yeah. I just kind of like take take it and just kind of be like, I'm hiding you. I am hiding. You. All right, already my back is horrible, <laughs> and I'm only on like the first five percent of this cross stitch, and my look at that, my back is horrible. That sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> you see, you see how she makes fun of me, chat. You see how you see. I'm how... just stating the obvious. No one's gonna see the uh -huh, back, so why are you uh -huh. stressing? Uh-huh. 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 I see. I see how you are. I see how you are. Um, all right. So let's say if you messed up, all this green's got to come out. You got you to gotta clear this. The easiest way to do this is you un... So you, you make sure that your thread is clear, and then you take your thread and you just pull it just like this and pull. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole, again for hanging out with us and being yeah, here. No problem. Goodbye, guys. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. And thank you for all the donations for the kids. You guys are amazing.